Welcome everyone to episode two of our video series about creating a complete and powerful application using the Find Toolkit. These live coding videos are published each Thursday, and that will be in the afternoon around UTC areas. Um, so watch this channel for more episodes to come. Last time, we started right at the beginning, and I created an application that showed you how to pull together a custom theme and layout with some standard widgets so that we could match a design that had been prepared in advance. I wanted to talk today about file handling, but I realised before we do that, we should talk about packaging, because last time we only ran the application on our local computer. So let's look first there and see how we can prepare this application for running on different platforms. So let's jump right in to the editor where we were using before. There are a couple of layout tweaks since the code that you saw, but essentially it all remains the same. Let's get started with our packaging by opening a new terminal. And just to remind ourselves where we were, let us go run this project one more time. And you'll be able to see the application layout as we left off last time. Now, that's great. If you've got all of the tools installed and you're working on the code, that's probably the easiest way to be interacting with your application. But that's not how we would want to distribute it to other people. We want to be able to package it like a graphical application would normally be distributed, not just a command line binary that Go would typically be creating. To do that, I'm going to reintroduce the fan fine command line tool that we were using earlier on. If you didn't install it last time, or if you're jumping right in and you don't have it, you can see more about that on our developer website if you go to Getting Started and Packaging. The instructions that we covered last time are right here. You just need to go install the Fine command line application from fine.io slash fine slash v2 slash cmd slash fine at latest, which will get you the latest version. And of course, if this is a piece of code that you've not worked on recently, I would recommend upgrading the fine version to be latest as well. It's always good to have these in sync. Anyhow, we have that installed already, so I can um, package this application, fine package, and that is going to attempt to create a graphical application bundle for the current system. But we can see here it's complaining that it doesn't have an icon. Well, that's quite understandable. We didn't make one before. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is add an icon to our application. Well, thankfully, I did prepare one of those before. So I can drop icon.png into our application here. And if I run package again, then it's going to go ahead and create exactly the application that we're looking for. If I open the current folder, you can see all of our files the icon that I recently added, and this dot app, which is the macOS app bundle. If we double click it, it's going to launch the application. It looks very familiar, but if you see in our task switcher, it has got the icon set. So you can see this now already feels a little bit more like a native application, and you could imagine sharing this with your friends. Of course, we might want to go one step further. Instead of just bundling it, we might want to have the application installed. And this same tool can do that for us. If we just type find install, it's going to package up that application, but into the system location for applications. So if we open our application searcher, you can see that it is found in the list of applications that we have available. Well, that's pr pretty useful. Of course, this is only for our local computer. So let's look at what we can do to help distribute that further. Before we jump in, I wanted to just show you one other helpful thing, because there's lots of different features, uh, com parameters to this packaging. We can see many of them by just going to the help. A lot of them will be explored later, but we don't need them right away. But you can see the name is uh, possible. We can set version numbers and things. But that can lead to a lot of parameters being passed in, and we might forget them. 
But also, we put the icon directly into the current package, because that's where it was expecting to find it. But actually, it doesn't seem you know so useful there. What if I wanted to put it in the assets folder along with our logo? Well, as you might imagine, the package command is going to fail again. So let's look at another way of specifying metadata. We can create a new file called fineapp.toml. Uh, um, although that does need to be in our application directory, not in the assets directory. So this is application metadata, and we can use this to specify certain values that we don't necessarily want to have to pass on the command line all the time. You can find more about the metadata file format if you go to app metadata in the getting started documentation. So we're going to go ahead and just use a couple of items from the example here. In fact, probably not even all of those. Ah, no, let's go with them all. So the icon, we've moved it into assets. So we can specify that the icon is in the assets folder. We can call this the fission app. And we can give it an app ID as well. This is like reverse DNS notation. The idea is that it is universally going to recognize your application on the web. And because we've registered fission.app, then app.fission is one way to identify this application. Now, if we save that file and run package again, it's going to create the package with the icon that we've set. And you might notice it created it with a slightly different name because we specified fission app as the name in our metadata, but it actually inferred fission as the name from our module that we declared earlier. Also, you'll see it inserted build one because it created the first build of the application. Let's just get rid of these temporary files and look at how we can prepare our packaging for other systems. So I'm developing on a Mac, which means that I can prepare for iOS devices without too much trouble. We could also be uh, doing the same for Android, but because I have an iOS simulator available, I thought it would be easiest to do that. So to prepare for a different system, I can do find package and specify the operating system, iOS simulator, which is a slightly different architecture to iOS, which is why we specify it's in the parameter there for the operating system. And you could insert Windows, Linux, whatever you're looking for in that parameter. And assuming it can find all of the tools it needs, then it will go ahead and create the package appropriate. So there we go. It's created the app, which confusingly it has the same name for testing iOS uh, simulator as it does when you're running an application on Mac. And if we open it here, you could see that it has created an app bundle. So let's just switch to the simulator. Uh, oh, it's on a different screen there. And drag our application in, which is how you would install an application into iOS um, simulators. And then we can just open the application. And here you can see the software is running exactly the same, but on a mobile device. Okay, so that was pretty cool. We put it onto an iPad. You could also set it up on an actual piece of hardware. You would package for iOS and then install it either using Xcode or you could type fine install and then dash OS iOS and it will use the iOS version of installing. So instead of your current operating systems application space, it will push it onto the first device that it can find. But while we're here, let's look at what else we can do. Well, a web browser is another way that it's possible to distribute your fine applications. So we can um, use another helpful tool in the fine command line. We could package for web, and that would create the files necessary to upload to a server. But we can also serve, and much like other 
command line tools for web development. This is going to start a web server locally with our application running so that we can access it through a browser. Let me just switch to a browser window and wait for that build to complete. Oh, maybe just another moment. There we go. So it's launched a web app on port 8080. And if we go there, it's the same application again. This is the layout and theme that we created with a little button. It actually doesn't go anywhere yet. But that is our full application running through a web browser. And as you can see, I didn't write any custom code to make any of that possible. We just ran the application through different system packaging. OK, excellent. Well, hopefully that has uh, inspired you a little bit more. Let's just delete these temporary files that we don't need, along with those there. I suppose I could do that in my file manager window as well, but that's OK. Get rid of those. Back to our application code. And we can move on to opening files in our application. So the concept here is that our application that we're building is going to be a folder somewhere on the computer, and we're going to want to open a folder, that's where the project is stored, and set up the user interface accordingly with the data that we find there. Okay, so there's a few things to do here, and we've taken the application from the very beginning to something that looks like the layout and the theme, but we haven't really added much to the user interface. You saw when we created the layout that there was a custom type to define the layout, and the same with the theme. But for our user interface, we actually didn't go ahead and do that. We just made some functions that were helpful to encapsulate the code into small areas. But now we're getting into a little bit more application development. We're going to need to know some state. And so I'm going to create that equivalent type. I'll just call it GUI. And that is a struct just like all of the others. In here, we're going to want to remember uh, references to important place, um, important widgets in the application. We'll pop them in in a minute when we know what's needed. But first of all, let's look at the opening of a folder. So let's create a new function. Open for, in fact, let's call it open project. To open something, we're going to use the dialog package and its open folder utilities in there. By using the abstractions in the toolkit, we know that this functionality is going to work on all of the supported platforms, so we don't have to worry about particularly how the file system works, how sandboxes are, and as you saw, these applications will work on iOS devices through web browsers, and so by taking this approach, we don't need to worry about those platform specifics. So we will want to show a dialog that asks the user to open a folder. So we use the dialog package and we show a folder open. Okay. If we save that file, um, I'm not quite sure why the imports get a little bit confused but we just correct them there, everything should work. And it's now indicating we don't have all of the parameters that we should have passed in. It's looking for a callback function that takes a listable URI and an error, and also the window. The second parameter window is what the dialog will be showed inside, because with fine, we try to minimize the number of open windows and dialogs appear inside a window, not as a new window over the top. The first parameter there, the callback, is what is executed when the user has made their selection. So we create that function. In fact, let's just copy it from the um, function definition, save the typing. We need to put a function body in here and we will pass a window, which we'll need to think about in a moment. This function here takes the directory, which is um, what the user will have chosen, or an error. 
we'll need to reference both of these. Now, before we dive into the code, what's this listable URI? Good question. So you might be familiar with URI, or at least URL. Uh, of course, we use URLs all the time to look up websites. URIs are a little bit more broad. They refer to a unique identity, a uniform resource identifier, which means that we can reference things on uh, file systems, web browsers, all sorts of different places. And the listable URI is something that Find has defined, which means it's a URI that refers to an area that can be listed, like a folder or a collection of resources on a web browser, for example. Anything, essentially, that could contain a bunch of individual items that we might use that make up a project. So we could use that directly and do things that, um, oh, excuse me. We don't want to name that function. That's what's confusing things. We could list the URIs inside our listable URI, for example, which we'll not do right away. Instead, let's figure out where this window comes from. So you noticed I created this struct earlier. Well, one of the things we put in here is going to be the reference to our window, which is of type find.window. And that's going to be really useful. Let's then make these functions part of our GUI behavior. These remain exactly the same as before, but they now will have access to the features of our user interface. And if we do the same for open project, then we can reference the window that we have set as g.win. Now for this to compile, we'll need to jump back to this main.go, which you can see is now failing. And instead of make GUI, we're going to have to pass a, we're going to have to construct a type. So our user interface type was GUI, and we want to set the window for our user interface. So now we have a new type called UI. That's showing the GUI that we just constructed and the window that it's going to be built within. And then we can call make GUI from that. So now our code over here is going to be able to show the dialog inside the same window that we're running within. OK, that's a good start. Maybe we should just see that in action. And I can log what has been received inside this function call. So we could print line directory open and um, the directory. And that will just print out a string form of the URI passed in. This is a little primitive, but it will help to see that things are working. Now, the open project is not being called yet. So let's just go back here. And just before we run the application, we will ask the user interface to start the open project code. OK, so let's run that. And now you can see we have a folder open dialog inside the application that has launched. If I pick this folder here, oh, excuse me, this folder here, we can open that folder and you'll see it opened the fission folder in my code and it has referenced it like a URL. It's a URI, it's a file location that means that we're able to then find that. Well, there we go. That's a good start. But obviously printing out to the command line, not a great start for a graphical application. So let's do something with this work. Inside here, we want to use this directory um, to show that we have opened the right, the right location, update some of the user interface. We're not going to do a huge amount right now because we're just working with the opening of the folder. Um, but let's make it update something useful. First of all, I suppose we could get the name of the folder. And uh, so that would be the directory dot name. Good start. And what could we do with that name? Well, we could update, I suppose, the window title. So we have access to the window already, and it has a set title function. So we could then say uh, fission 
app and pass it this name. Well, that will help to indicate that we've updated something, the folder has been opened, but it would be nice to you know, reflect that inside the application because not all operating systems are going to have a window border where the title appears. So let's see if we can put it into the content. Our content that we set up here is just a rectangle. So maybe we can do something with that. If we had a label, for example, um, I'll just call it directory. New label. Um, we'll leave that empty for now because we haven't actually opened a directory when the user interface is created. Um, this content here isn't really just a rectangle now. It is um, a stack of these two items. That would be that would be ideal. So we'll do container new stack. We'll put the rectangle underneath, and then above it we will put this directory um, widget. So now we'll have an empty widget on top of a plain rectangle, so it won't really uh, show much. We want to update this directory later. To do that, we need to keep a reference to it here in our structure. So we could store that. It's a widget.label. Uh, and that means that we can get access to it later. And to do that, we need to set it. So instead of creating a new variable, we can just assign it to the directory field and reference the same one here. Now, it's not always the best thing to just store a list of types, especially particularly the graphical primitives or the widgets that you're using inside your application structure. You might want something a little bit more decoupled. For that, we have data binding, and I will come back to that at a later date. Suffice to say, there's a cleaner way to do this, but this is a really good way to get started, especially as you're understanding your application structure and you want to really know particularly which items are going to be impacted by which changes. So then here we can go to dg, sorry, dot directory, and we can set the text on that label. In fact, we could just set that to the directory name. Now, we could be done here but we've not actually handled this error, which is always a thing to, to check for. So actually, if there was an error, we, um, we probably want to handle that. If the error was not nil, then do something else. We could log it, we could print it to the command line, um, but actually there's another helpful dialog that might be appropriate here. So we can call show error in the dialog package. We just pass the error itself and the window that it should be displaying within. So we're not handling the error really, but we're telling the user that an error occurred. And if that happened, we want to exit this function and not process any further. There is actually one other case that we've not handled. This directory here, the listable URI, it could be nil. The user might have used this folder open and not actually picked a folder. So we should also check if this directory is nil. And if that is the case, well, there's not really a lot that we could do. So we can simply return again. And with that in mind, we know that errors will have exited and the directory exists. So we can then safely assume that the name will run, we'll get the information, and that we'll be updating the user interface appropriately for the user. OK. That's pretty useful. Let's see how that works. Just a little more compiling to go. And let's try and get the right folder this time. We'll open it there. And there we go. The window title has changed to show the folder we have opened. And we put the name into the content of our application as well. So we have opened the folder successfully. Great start. But what happens if we run that again and we cancel. Well, the application didn't crash because we handled it, but cancelling the opening of a folder doesn't leave our application in a great state. So we could do something about that. We could go to our main, and instead of just open the project, we could, I suppose, try again if, um, if the user cancelled it. However, we know when the user cancelled already. 
So we could execute the same thing from inside here. And the user interface, actually, we've called G here. So we can call the same function again inside our handler. And that means when the user cancels, it shows another directory and we can just get a second chance to choose our folder. Yep, okay. Well, that's great. But then what if, um, what if that wasn't the path that we wanted to take? What if there was some default content uh, instead of showing that we wanted to have um, some welcome information, I suppose. This label here could have said, welcome to Fission, uh, open a folder from the menu. Uh -huh. Okay, well, we can go and see what that does. Not very much, it's, it's there. We're opening a folder already. And here, where's the menu? So let's just very quickly put together a little menu in our application. So to put a menu inside a window, it's what's called a main menu. And we can simply set that on the window. Set main menu. You can see it takes a parameter, which is the main menu. Let's just make a little helper rout routine again. Make menu. And we could probably just leave this in our main package for now. Make menu. And we want to return the fine main menu. I'm not going to put a huge amount in it right now. So let's just return a new um, main menu. And that will have one menu in it. Uh, actually, let's use the um, helper constructor commands. New menu. And that's asking for a label for the menu and a content, which is a list of items. So let's call this the file menu. And in the items, it is a um, slice of um, menu items. Uh, we'll put one in there. Um, new menu item, which is a label and a function, which is the action when the user selects it. Open project. And here we can just uh, ask it to open our op um, open project function. But you can see it's not going to work because it doesn't know what the user interface is. Well, let's just tidy this up. Um, new menu. Oh, what's it complaining about here? Ah, we've just created a slice, but it doesn't actually want a slice. It's just looking for a list of menu items, I think. Um, good of me. What's happening? List of menu item pointers. Da oh, yes, I see. This is a slice of menu items, not, um, not pointers to menu items. I think that is probably the issue. Um, and that should be called new menu item. Not quite. Menu item. Um, I think I just typed a few things wrong here. The main menu takes a list of menus. Right. I'm going to break this out. I'm getting a little confused in the indentation. So file menu is a new main menu. That's pretty clear. Um, and then the main menu. Maybe there's a maybe we should use a little helper here. New main menu um, with the file menu. We've got one extra bracket here. 
Okay, we're getting close. <laughs> um, and then new menu item. Okay, yeah. So now we've got the compiler here that I was expecting. We didn't know what user interface it's referring to. So we can pass that in here, um, which is the GUI type. Or we could make this part of the user interface, like we did before. So now make menu operates as part of the user interface type, and we could call it like this instead. Yep. The menu item is almost happy. We didn't. Um, oh goodness, I've doubled up here. I don't know quite. I don't know quite how that happened, but I have inserted way too many words. We just use the new menu, new menu with a new menu item, and that menu is part of the main menu that we're returning. That seems quite content. So when we tap open project, it is going to execute the open project function. Well, that, look, that looks pretty good. So when we run this code, it will prompt us, but we'll cancel. The application doesn't seem to have a menu. Well, that's because we're running on a Mac and the menus are up here. So we can open the project and that's going to trigger the same workflow. You can see there's other menus here. Mac has a few standard items and we can use the system provided quit to exit the application. But we could also test what it would look like on other platforms as well. There's a helpful tag that we can pass called no uh, native menus. Um, tags, oops, sorry, that's tags. And that's doing a slightly different compilation and it's telling it to ignore the macOS standard menu and put one in the window as though it was like a Windows or Linux application. And here you can see our open project feature, but also a quit. Because there's no, we're telling it there's no um, system native menu, it's automatically added the quit menu item for us. So there we go, we've introduced menus as well. Apologies for quite a few typos there, but you can see um, if I remembered it correctly, it would be relatively straightforward. There is one other way, of course, that we could want to open this application. We could go run it or um, use the application from the command line, or the folder could be passed in as a parameter to the application. So if I wanted that, I could say, um, use the current directory to run the application. But we've not done anything that would make that work. So the last thing that I wanted to look at was how we might handle that using command line flags. So, of course, Go has a built-in flags package that will help us to do that. And so we can use that to um, add information about how people can interact with our application from the command line, just by starting it. This is not a command line app, of course. So let's um, help people, I suppose, understand that with a little bit of usage. You don't want you don't want folks to be left guessing. So flag.usage allows us to specify a function that prints out, uh, the, I suppose, part of the help text. So we can just um, do that print out something like a usage line. Uh, I will say uh, fission and then um, project directory. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's that's probably all we need to do. We're not adding any parameters here, so we're not really setting up the flags package. And then all we need to do is call parse, which tells the flags package it's got all of the information it needs and that we would like it to go ahead and execute. Um, okay, so We've said that there's an optional um, item at the end. Um, let me just correct the typo there for usage. So 
There's no parameters, but they can add a item at the end. So we need to see if they did that before we before we do anything. So um, if the uh, length of the flag arguments um, is not zero, if it's greater than zero, then we know that they tried to pass a parameter into our application. In fact, we can uh, get that um, the path that they specified is then going to be in the args. Um, like the args it's going to be argument zero. That's the, the first one. Uh, so we could print that out. Um, but of course, the user has passed it in, so I'm sure they know what's going on. The next thing that we're going to want to do is to pass that information in to some kind of um, project open handler. Well, before we just had our little function in the user interface that did it directly, basically. So let's let's extract that um, so that we can reuse it. This open project um, function here probably should be something uh, a little bit more like um, open project dialog, I guess. Um, so let's just re um, rename this here. Rename symbol. Um, oh, that didn't really work very well. Let's just do that manually. Open project dialog and in main. Dialog. We'll come back to that again in a moment. And then we'll create a new function which actually does open a project. Now, which project is it going to open? That is the question. This is our directory. And we're going to be passing into this a listable URI, which I mentioned earlier. And from that, we can take this code, put it into open project. And inside our callback, we will call open project pass in the directory which we have checked for here. So that will do exactly the same as before, but we can now call open project from the command line flags. So what we would then do is call open project with a directory. Now, how do we get from a directory path? to the directory, which is a listable URI. To do this, we have um, some helpful commands introduced in the storage package. Um, as you can see, there's all sorts of functions here, exploring different uh, potential storage file system interactions. And what we can do is uh, use these to turn our path into a URI. So we know that this is a file system path because somebody has operated the application from the command line, they passed in a directory parameter. So we can then say new file URI. And this constructor simply takes a path string. Well, that's exactly what we have. So this has created a URI for us. Um, which is halfway there. We're actually going to need to do a little bit more work because the URI may refer to a file or something else that can't really contain a folder. So we need to know if it is listable. To do this, we're going to use um, the lister for URI. Lister for URI. And that tries to take a URI and return a listable version of it. Now this will succeed if what we pass in is truly listable and it could return an error otherwise. So the directory is the success criteria. The error is what could happen if we didn't, uh, didn't really have the right um, item passed in. So if this error did occur, if it's not nil, we need to we need to handle something here. Um, so we could use the dialog package from before, but realistically, we're not launched the application yet. So it's probably more helpful to print it out. Um, to 
to um, just print it to the command line. Opening project. Um, and we can uh, just pass the error. And that's going to print it out to the user. Um, but we don't really want to go any further. The application hasn't been able to launch. So we could exit there. Of course, there's things we could try to do to recover. We could um, throw up the user interface with the project selection dialog, but it's unlikely that that's what they're going to be wanting. So at this point, we know we have a directory and we can pass it in. Excellent. However, we're going to show the project dialog after that. So let's just tidy this little corner up and say only open the project dialog if we didn't pass in a command line parameter. Okay, so let's just run the same command again. We will ask it for the current directory. Uh, PWD, by the way, is exactly that. I could specify the dot to mean the current directory. So now we're running the current project and passing it the current directory for the project. Oh, I did not tidy up something earlier. New menu item is using the wrong function because we renamed it. So just scrolling down here, open project dialog. Okay. I should have noticed that in the header, it was bright red and I just didn't do anything about it. Interesting, so we have dot as our project name. That's not quite what we were looking for. So our directory path wasn't really understood. Hmm. Thankfully, there's ways that we can uh, work with that. We can um, get the absolute path. So that would be file path absolute. Um, we're just tidying up the current directory path. So that shouldn't be a problem. But we need to handle an error. So in that case, if there was an error here, well, I suppose we'll do the same thing again. Um, print perhaps a slightly different error message. Um, uh, error. Project path. Um, and hopefully that is then able to interpret the full stop as the current directory. And there you have it. We have opened the fission project directory, it's set there. And if we wanted to then open a different project, we could go into our file menu, open project, and I could uh, choose a different one, slides, there we go. And it's now open the slides project. We're not seeing a huge amount, I suppose, because we haven't actually added the file handling to our user interface. There's a lot more things that we could be doing, but I didn't want to cover too many things in one video. We could leave it there, but I feel like I teased data binding a little bit too much. So perhaps we could just have a quick look at that um, before we wrap up the video. So if we go back to our project type, we have um, saved the window here. That's actually going to be useful. As you saw, we have that used in quite a few places when we need to show dialogues. But this, um, this label called directory here, well, it's not particularly meaningful to have that um, stored to just set values on it. It would be more helpful, I think, to reference here its purpose or to provide a binding that would help us to say, okay, this is referring to the project title, really, instead of just a, an output label. By using data binding, we're able to decouple the source of the data from places that are going to use it. So in this situation, we could call the um, binding just title, I suppose, and it will be of type um, binding.string. It is a data binding of string type. Now, if we save that, it manages to mess up our imports just one more time. We need to have V2 in that they've all got to match. Otherwise, we'll have some strange API version conflicts. So now we have a data binding here instead. What do we do with it? Well, absolutely, let's, let's dive in. Firstly, we need to um, initialize it. So when the user interface is created, 
We could, of course, write a helper method for this and probably will at some point. But for now, we can simply um, say binding um, binding dot new string, which is going to default to an empty string, which is exactly the right thing to be doing at the moment. We don't have a project loaded, so it's empty. Of course, we could set it up with the default value that we were displaying in our user interface here. But let's let's step away from that welcome text um, and bind this to our value instead of a direct output for just to show how it works, I suppose. So the directory is not being set into the user interface struct anymore. We're just creating a new label called directory. We'll pass that over there. But instead of passing it in this way, what we're going to do is bind it. We could do that by calling bind on an existing label, or we can construct it by asking for a new label with existing data. And that is the title. So here we're saying that this directory is a label that's bound to this string value. So anytime the title changes, then our directory label will update. When we then open a project, we were currently setting the text into the directory, but instead we need to update the string value. So title is going to have its value set to the name of the project that we have added. We could also ask the window title to be bound to this, but considering we are just updating it in the same code, it's probably not a big deal right now. And that, mm, that may be everything. Let's save that file and give it a run. Well, I suppose we could open it in exactly the same way as before. And it looks exactly the same as before. Fission, the fission. Let's open a new project. Slides, open. And here you can see the value has updated. This one was set manually and this one was set through data binding. So hopefully that helps to demonstrate that we don't have to be storing references to widgets and updating them manually. In fact, just to uh, complete, I suppose, the implementation here, if for some reason the window was not um, something that you wanted to reference in this way, we could bind to an existing um, string like this. So instead of manipulating the window from the open project, which you could consider a bad practice, we can go back to where we actually do set our window up. And here we're able to do a bit of data binding so that we can manipulate the window. The window, it doesn't have a bind function like label does because, you know, the window doesn't serve the purpose of displaying a string. But we're able to bind items that don't natively understand the type by using uh, a data listener. So we could say um, ui.title.addListener. And the binding package has a helpful new data listener which just takes a, an anonymous function. And we can add and remove this listener on the type. So this is just helping us to construct uh, a function that could be added and removed. We could save that and remove it later, but we're quite happy to have this attached for the duration of the application. And so this binding is going to execute every time the string changes. So the name will be the value of the, the string binding when this calls. So we call get, and that will return the string. And then from here, we can update this window, which we have direct re reference to, and set the title to be fission app with the name. And I think we're just short one parenthesis there. And there's a compile error because get can error it seems unlikely in this case, but if there was a chain of values, it would be possible for a conversion to fail or maybe 
the source of data was a remote system or a complex type of some sort. But we can assert that's not a problem here. So in this version, there's ever so slightly more code. But what we're using is a local reference to the window object bound to data that's going to be updated elsewhere. And so if we run the application just one more time, in the normal way, the title is blank. The field there isn't showing the name of a library. We can open it here, and they're both updating automatically. And so in this way, we've separated the source data from the widget, or in fact, any other aspect of our program that doesn't really want to be referenced in lots of places, uh, but does want to respond when some information is changed. Of course, before I forget about packaging for a second week in a row, I thought it'd be really useful just to demonstrate that all of the things we've done today do truly work across these different platforms. And opening folders, files, and working with data is actually no different on mobile devices, desktops, or anything. So let's just, one last time before we wrap up, package for the iOS simulator. My package minus OS iOS simulator. We'll run that function and I will just activate our simulator again. Here it is, uh, bring it in on landscape this time, it fits the screen just a little bit better. Let's just open the current directory and take the new version of this app onto the iPad. There you can go, it has updated and we can launch and see that it is opening an iOS version of the folder open. If we had a iCloud Connect, we can use there, or if we had any folders, we would open them. But for now, I'll just show our storage being opened. And you can see it's referencing a fairly peculiar name, but that's iOS's way of saying, open the storage from our file provider. We will see more of that working in future videos. Okay, well, there we go. That's all for today. Uh, I hope that was super useful to you. And sorry for the um, little add-on of data binding. I think it was interesting given where we've been working. Uh, do please come back next Thursday. Uh, that week we're going to be looking at uh, Setup Wizard, how we can construct a new project when the application loads instead of opening an existing one. And from there, we will update the user interface to show the files in our project so we won't just have the label with the project name, but actually start to see some information showing in the user interface. If this has been helpful or interesting, please do subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on future videos. And if you would like to learn more about what we're building, then don't forget that you can go to the project website, fission.app to learn more, or click on collaborative app builder. If you would like to read more about the application or sign up for early access, as soon as there are places available. Thank you so much again, and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.